Welcome to WCAT. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. And I have with me today Christopher Riley from John Paul II University, Catholic University in California. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Dr. Kiki. Chris. Great to have the chance to talk with you today. That's exciting. Um, so you're a, a, a screenwriter, film director, and you're teaching film at the university. So you're back there. So you're a storyteller. I, I am. And as you say those things that I get to do each day, I, I feel uh, really privileged because um, those are the things, both teaching and filmmaking are the things that if I could choose how to spend my days, those are the things I would choose to do. Well, it's exciting. I am also able to do the things I love, which is great. How about you start us off with a quick prayer? Yeah, I would love to. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for this opportunity to have a conversation about things that um, uh, I, I pray you will bring out the best things that you have taught me and uh, Kiki over our lives, and that what we say will somehow be a gift and a benefit to the people who listen. Um, fill us with your spirit now and give us your words. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, I mean, to me, storytelling is the heart of everything. I mean, we, we live our lives um, and, and we, ha we each have a story. Um, and the importance, um, especially when either really good things happen in our lives or really bad things happen in our lives, our need to tell that story, sometimes to tell it over and over again. Um, and uh, so, you know, and also, uh, was it C.S. Lewis said, you know, we read to know we're not alone. Um, I think it's also we go to see movies, to see films, to know we're not alone. That is actually what first drew me to movies. Uh, as a high school student, uh, I was a pretty shy uh, kid who uh, didn't want to be isolated, but I didn't know how to bridge that gap with people and have meaningful interactions. And, and then I started seeing films that revealed their characters to me uh, and started teaching me uh, about what it was to be a person, what it was to be human. And I was so drawn to that uh, for what it did for me, but also the prospect of maybe being able to tell those kinds of stories uh, for other people as well. So yeah, the human connection that can happen in story, whether it's on film or stage or on the page, uh, is one of the most compelling things because we really do long not to be alone. <laughs> what was the first film you saw that made you go, whoa, like this is important? I, uh, I was in high school in the late 70s and um, I, I was kind of watching my first films then in the early 80s. Uh, the first two that really hit me were The Deer Hunter, which was a Vietnam era film, uh, and very specifically the film Ordinary People. Um, and it, it showed me, the main character was a high school kid, so about my age, who was struggling and, um, and yet appeared to be fine on the surface. And that was a revelation to me that the people around me who appeared like they had it together in a way that I didn't might actually be struggling in, in ways that I was and so I thought, oh, I'm not alone. And number two, I've got to be much nicer to people if, <laughs> if they might really be suffering in the ways that this character was suffering. And then the third thing was, oh, and I, I would love to be able to somehow be part of making films. And it was only later I discovered that people actually wrote these things. And that that was what interested me much more than standing behind uh, a camera as a camera operator or something like that. I was just, I'm, I've always 
wanted to be able to shape and fine tune what I do. So I started uh, in college uh, assistant directing live news. And uh, you're always looking at the preview monitor of like, what's the next shot? So you never even see the thing that you made and you can't go back and fix it. And after doing that, I realized that is not what I want to do. I want to I want to be able to sit and and craft the story that I'm telling. And I so I found my way to screenwriting during my college years. So so that gives you that opportunity to shape it, to be on the creative side of it, obviously. Yes, I get to sit and um, you know how in real life, uh, after we've had a conversation with somebody, hours later, we think, oh, I wish I had said that. Well, <laughs> as a screenwriter, you get to do that. You, know, you, you get to collect all of these good ideas over a long period of time. And, uh, and so we end up appearing much smarter than we are because <laughs> in two hours, you get to fly through a year's worth of our best ideas. That's fascinating. So tell us a little bit about how you got from that point to now you're teaching at the university, you're teaching young people, which is so exciting. Yeah, um, I really love teaching and hope to do it as long as, you know, I can be upright. And <laughs> I, I, uh, my wife and I got married right out of, school and um, both wanted to go to Hollywood and work in film and television. And so we threw all our stuff in the in a U-Haul trailer and drove to Los Angeles, not really knowing anyone uh, and spent about a year trying to get some kind of job. I remember standing outside the walls of Warner Brothers in Burbank and wondering how in the world do you get past this wall? And oddly, I also had the thought, if I ever get over the wall, I want to be able to reach back and pull in some other people behind me. Uh, That's after, so important. Well, and it's I, I'm not sure why I had that desire, but that's always been something I've wanted to do. I think maybe it's part of the storytelling impulse that... Um, we're learning these things, we're having these experiences, and they become more real in a sense, only when we tell the story. Uh, and so I, I have- share the story, that sharing of the story with others. Yeah, st stories need, they need at least two of us. Um, we need to be storytellers who are brave and vulnerable, and generous with our stories. And then we need to be uh, story listeners. And, and that's a discipline. I am in the early stages of learning how to be uh, see the James Joyce or Henry James who, who used the phrase, the great empty cup of attention. Uh, it's, a, it's a phrase my wife recently introduced me to. And I'm trying to become that great empty cup of attention uh, so that I can offer that attention to others and that I also can get filled up with what they have to share with me. So it's a, the stories are a, a give and take uh, and one of the great ways we connect with each other. Well, I mean, the importance of community. I mean, we know God is Trinity. God himself is a community of persons. He's not, you know, alone. And, and the importance, I often think of, Oh, you probably know the young man who went up into Alaska by himself. There was a book and a, and a film written about him up in Alaska, and he died in that school bus up there alone. And wasn't his uh, name Chris? It was Chris something, and I think the book is Into the Wild. And Into the Wild, and yeah. the film was also. And I remember one of the last things he wrote, I believe, either in his journal up there or on the wall inside was, um, you know, that basically happiness – is only only comes when you can share it with someone else. Yeah, there was something so poignant about that film because he learned that great lesson and yet died alone because he, he learned it kind of too late. And he couldn't get back across. He did try to come back, um, yeah. but couldn't cross the river and didn't know where the where the railing was to get across, which was, which yeah. was such a shame. 
Um, but yeah, that need for community, that need to tell the story. Um, I had a dear friend who's, who's some of her family survived the earthquake in Haiti. And um, she was able to bring her mother um, over to her home afterwards and some of the children who survived. But her daughter had died and she lost her um, she lost her home, she lost her country. And the mother kept telling the story of the earthquake over and over and over again. And of course, it was driving the, the surviving daughter crazy. She said, you know, it's bad enough, the whole situation, but mom keeps telling the story over and over. And I said, she'll do that until the healing comes, you know, until it sort of moves from your conscious down to your subconscious where the healing can happen. Um, I said, she has to tell the story. And and when she knew that, she kind of relaxed into the storytelling that was so important um, to this poor elderly lady who had lost so much um, that, that healing comes through stories. It, it does. And it's also, um, there's grieving that's happening in that storytelling of, you know, all that was lost in that earthquake. And uh, if we if we don't tell the stories, we just carry that inside of us and actually get in the way of of the healing that can happen when we 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 need to tell the story. We need somebody to listen um, and not dismiss or minimize the experience. Um, and uh, and there's a vulnerability that comes with telling our stories, but there's also the, the recognition of, oh, you too. Um, yeah. That's that's so important in building authentic community. Mm. Sort of waiting sometimes for the heart to be opened when we tell a story, or waiting for someone to say, oh, I get it, I get it. And, and I imagine in, in creating a film, you're looking for that sense of, can I get someone to get it? <laughs> Well, that's exactly right. Uh, and um, when, you know, when I was standing outside that wall at Warner Brothers, not able to figure out how to get in, um, after about a year, uh, I eventually got a call from someone I knew from church who said, hey, we need a script proofreader at Warner Brothers. And I told them to hire you. And they did. And so suddenly I was going through that gate every day. And, and that was the beginning of my education, really, of how do I tell stories that connect with people? Uh, how do I tell, how do I create shared meaning, which I think means you have to live with people. Uh, I think Jesus is a great example of that. Um, God didn't send us a text message. He, he came to live among us and um, and he didn't immediately start talking. He he spent decades uh, inhabiting our world, our culture, learning the language with which he would eventually tell his stories. And I I found that was what uh, what allowed me to begin to like know the craft of being a screenwriter but beyond that being an inhabitant of the world who who knows people and their life experiences um you know i think of paul when he's in athens the book of acts talks about how he spoke to the people in athens when he was in a jewish synagogue he spoke from the jewish scriptures that was a shared cultural resource that was common ground with that audience. But in Athens, he didn't do that. He spoke of their shrines, their idols, and he quoted their scripture, or not their scripture, but their poetry. And as I thought about him quoting their poetry, I thought, to quote poetry, you have to read poetry and you have to memorize it. And that means he really inhabited that sphere of culture he he read poetry and found things that that he loved that rang true to him and then he was able to create shared meaning um, 
he didn't change the truth of what he had to share, but he was able to translate it into the language of his audience. And I think that's for my years at Warner Brothers, what was happening with me. I was learning that common language so that later than when I started selling scripts and getting hired by studios to write films, I, I had been able to speak that common language. Yeah, as a Christian, you, you made this conscious decision to stick with Hollywood rather than going into more faith-based um, filmmaking areas. Of course, I immediately think of The Chosen these days. <laughs> we're, uh, we're Chosen fans, um, which I'm assuming you've seen. Uh, the Chosen is uh, one of, um, you know, an example of faith-based media that has grown, uh, grown its audience. Uh, I think going back to probably the Passion of the Christ as the first real breakout sort of uh, film that uh, that was made with a substantial budget at a really high artistic level and that reached a wide audience. Um, the Chosen is kind of in that, um, kind of carries on that legacy. And uh, and I I so appreciate and value what they're doing. I think the chosen in particular is helping people get a a view of Jesus as um, you know he's kind of coming off the painting on the wall and becoming <laughs> the real person that he is. You know this miracle of fully God and fully human. And the chosen I think is is helping people who believe in that two-dimensional Jesus stuck on, on the wall, they're help, helping them to really get a picture of, oh, this is the, this is the person and God I'm, I'm following. So I think there's so much value in that. And at the same time... Been, for us, it's been fun just because like now when the, the priest says, you know, the gospel according to Matthew, Jim and I turn to one another and we're like, we know Matthew. You know? Yeah, that, oh, that guy. <laughs> yeah, we know that guy. Um, right. Or, or, you know, when Nicodemus says something, we're like, oh, we were there when that happened. You know, we have this whole different sense of, of reality, I think, than we had before. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I, years ago I traveled to Israel and suddenly places I had read about, I realized, oh, that's an actual place, and I was there. And story can vicariously do that for us, and that's what I think The Chosen is doing for us. And um, and I'm appreciating that work, and I'm training people to go and help do that kind of work for an audience of mostly people who are believers. And and yet I recognize that my own personal calling is not that. Um, and I, I think of Jesus when there were questions about why are you having dinner with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, I'm a doctor and a doctor spends time with the sick. And um, I have come not to call the righteous, but the unrighteous. And I, um, and I resonate with that as um, what my own assignment is. Um, and then I, I was reading again today in Matthew, where Jesus sent his disciples out, and he said, don't go to the Samaritans. Um, go to the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So there's that call as well. And both are completely legitimate and valuable. We sort of dismiss the, we say, you're preaching to the choir well, the choir needs to be preached to. Yeah, and so there's value in that. And then there's also value in crossing cultural boundaries. Um, that's um, yeah. that's a maybe a definition of what it is to be a missionary, is to, to leave your own home sphere of culture and to go out into the, the whole world. And my the world I'm called to is the world of, of Hollywood and mainstream storytelling whether it's literally a studio film or an indie film or i've worked in european cinema 
but all aimed at mainstream audiences. You know, I just read a book that I would not recommend for many people, but um, my daughter gave it to me for Christmas. Um, it's, it's about 400 pages. It's called A Little Life. I don't know if you've heard of it. A Little I have Life not. by Hanya and a long Japanese last name. But um, God is mentioned, small g, once in the book. Uh, God, capital G, is not mentioned at all, and it's the story of five basic male friends, who um, one of whom is a severely damaged man, um, abused sexually, physically, emotionally as a child, and just sort of hanging on to life by a thread throughout his life. And it's the story of his four or five friends that try to help him through life try to help keep him alive, help keep him moving forward. Um, and when I finished the book, I, I, I had the same reaction that my daughter had reading it. I sat here and wept like a baby for an hour after reading it. Um, would consider it one of the top five best books I've ever read. Wow. Um, and it, it, like I said, it didn't mention God. It didn't mention religion. Um, but when it was when I was finished, I had this clear understanding that I knew more about how God loves me than anything else I'd ever read. Um, because it was like this group of people just it was almost like an um, you know like a metaphor and an, uh, an allegory of God's love for us. However imperfect it was with this group of people, but they loved this man unconditionally. They didn't always do it well, um, but they kept trying. And it was it's a beautiful story. It's not an easy story. Like I said, not one I'd recommend to a lot of people, um, but it was incredible. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it always has to. I think it has the same foundation that you know, a book like Lord of the Rings has, or The Chosen has, the same foundation of, of God as love was there without ever mentioning, without it being a religious book at all. Um, it's, it, I, I think, you know, your description of the way you were so moved, um, I think in, like on two levels, I think, there was the emotion that, that was touched in you, and you talked about like weeping for an hour, and then there was an insight that came to you of, oh, this is how God loves me. So there's meaning that, yeah. that, that story and art more broadly can convey. Uh, and Jesus told many stories that were not, that didn't have religious content. <laughs> uh, I, the only religious content in the story of the Good Samaritan uh, are the priests who step over the fallen body. Uh, you know, they're the villains. And right. um, so it's not really a religious story. It's a story about a guy who gets mugged and, you know, and his cultural enemy, the Samaritan, ends up pulling out his debit card and saying, you know, I'll pay for whatever this guy needs. That's how Jesus chooses to answer this theological question, which is, all right, if you say I have to love my neighbor, uh, I'm looking for loopholes, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this story, doesn't have overtly religious right. content, and yet it's pointing to one of the, what he identified as one of the deepest spiritual truths is love each other. And this is what it looks like. Yeah, this is what it looks like. Yeah. And it's messy. Love is Oh, so my goodness. Messy. Uh, the, <laughs> when I, I, I was always, you know, for, as a, even as a teenager, I was really interested in stories of people who, you know, converted from a life of crime and came to faith. And, uh, and I thought, how great it would be to like sit down with somebody at a diner and have that input in their life and their life turns on a dime and then you move on to the next town. And it's not like that. Anytime I have had an opportunity to be involved in someone's life 
and and I've seen a change for the better. It's been so messy and it's been over a course of years. And there are times where I've just thought, what in the world is going on here? Uh, this is doomed. Uh, life itself is messy. The book you've described is, you know, it sounds like it's also messy and difficult. Well, that Welcome means reality. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my relationships are hard. Life is hard. I think you're saying, even, you know, um, when you think of conversion stories from, you know, like you're saying, someone's a mess and a criminal to now they're not. Um, you know, my own story could, you know, curl your ears. <laughs> so, yeah, life is messy. And it's, in, I think it's so important sometimes um, when our lives are messy, we think only our life is messy. Like we're yeah. it. We're the only jerk in the world. You know? yep. We're the only loser. Um, and then we find out like, well, no, we're all jerks and we're all losers and we're all in this struggle together to to try to know love and serve God. But it's it's messy. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And mostly we know that we're not the only one through stories, whether it's a story that a friend tells us one on one or it's a story that's told in a book or on the screen, we, that's how we find out what other people's lives are like. So what is it like teaching at John Paul <laughs> the Second University? Like, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I love it. I love it. So we, you know, we get a wide range of students uh, from all over the place who have an interest in either filmmaking or video game design. Um, and often they feel like they are the oddball in their community of origin. Uh, they're the one who is running off to join the circus. And then they arrive and they find their tribe because they're surrounded by other people who have gone off to join the circus. And, um, and so to be able to, first of all, validate that and say, actually, this, this yearning you have to, to make things, to create imaginative works, it's part of you being in, created in the image of God, the, the creator. And, in Genesis, we see that God invites humans into this culture-making creative process, uh, puts a garden in, in their care. A garden is not just nature, it's nature plus culture. And, um, and so humans are given this, and then God says, here, here's the whole world. Um, the first time... Uh, that the Old Testament describes anyone being filled with God's spirit, uh, it's artists. It's the people who are going to build the tabernacle. And God actually names them and says, I've, I've put my spirit and my gifts in them to do this creative work. So that's ennobling to, to, to hear that, you know, what I'm doing is not um, frivolous. Uh, I just recently had some students read John Paul II's letter to artists. Wow. And uh, yeah. when I, the first time I read that, it was so moving to me because he was telling me that this, this calling I have as a storyteller matters. Well, and I mean, he was an artist long before he was Pope. He was doing plays and writing. And, yeah, and so he, he, he understood. His whole papacy was like he knew he was on stage and he knew how to use it, which was one of the things that was most brilliant about his papacy is he yes. always knew where the camera was. And he didn't I don't want to say he played to it in a bad sense, but he played to it for the world to receive his message. Like Paul, he knew how to be all things to all people wherever he went. Um, yes, and he, sure. they, his, his face, they say, it was the most seen face of any face in the world ever of anyone wow. who ever lived it was john paul ii's face 
Oh, that's that's extraordinary to to consider. And then he also, um, you know, he inhabited buildings that were filled with some of the greatest art ever made. And um, so he, he's surrounded uh, by that. But yeah, also um, he was a poet and a man of the theater. And so he understood the life of an artist from, from experience. Uh, so I, I have the privilege of sharing those kinds of, of things with students. And then also drawing from um, my years of learning things the hard way. I never really took a I, I took like one screenwriting class. When I tell students that, they look really alarmed. But I, I, I learned as a studio film writer. And um, so I'm able to bring those things that I've learned into the classroom and then help students tell their stories. When, uh, when the university was first being accredited, there were professors from other universities who came to assess what we were doing. And one of them asked me, uh, what's your goal with your students? What are you trying uh, to do with them? And before I could answer, he said, I'll tell you what your goal is. You're trying to turn them into you. And he was saying that as if that was, that should be my goal. And I had to think about that for a while. And after pondering that for a couple of days, I realized, no, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to turn them into them. And I, I find that because they have different life experiences and different interests and different tastes than I do, they have different stories than I have to tell. And my task is to equip them and sort of set them free to tell those stories at the highest artistic level they can. Um, I also try to equip them with an understanding that um, stories are a gift, um, stories have power. And so with that comes Spider-Man has taught us responsibility. <laughs> and so we think about the ethics of entertainment um, and how we can make our stories a gift that in some way leaves an audience either wiser or uh, less alone or just encouraged to keep pushing forward one more day. But there's something that, uh, that the story can, can bring to an audience that helps them. And I've, I mean, I've seen so many films and TV shows that have helped me um, I'm more compassionate uh, for people because I've I've gotten to see them in a way that lets me really understand what their lives are like. It's a little bit of walking a mile in someone else's shoes. Um, someone has said, once you know someone's story, uh, it's hard to hate them. Uh, so, you know, good films make it harder for me to kill people. Uh, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I can, I remember a time where I was incredibly discouraged. Um, and part of that was related to the fact that uh, studios develop 10 films for every one they make. And so you can work as a Hollywood writer and make a good living and still be artistically frustrated um, by that futility of, pouring your heart into a creative work that never reaches the screen and reaches an audience. And I was feeling that futility. Part of what helped pull me out of that was telling that story to friends who sat with me and cried with me. And part of it was watching a Steve Carell comedy uh, <laughs> called Dan in Real Life that made me laugh again for the first time. And so I'm grateful for the gift of that story. Yeah, being able to laugh at ourselves, being able to be grateful for just things the way they are, which aren't always the way we want them to be at this moment, you know, and then of course, we always sometimes we pray for things and they don't come and years later, we're like, shoo, dodge that bullet, glad God didn't answer that prayer the way I wanted it answered. Um, but that takes time. Yeah. In the meantime, it, we tell our story. <laughs> right. Well, and, and stories take 
experiences and events and arrange them in a meaningful pattern. Uh, so that story of I prayed for the thing I desperately wanted. God did not give me that thing. And later I reached a place where I saw that he saved me from myself. Well, that's a story because it it's putting the events into a meaningful pattern. And then we are able effortlessly to somehow draw emotion and meaning from that. So you, know, you described reading this beautiful novel and the novel didn't end with a little epilogue that said, and Kiki, this is how God loves you. Your, your brain, soul, heart um, drew those conclusions uh, and you probably didn't sit down and put a lot of effort into analyzing the novel and what could this mean for me. You just see it. it happens, yeah. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned a minute ago was that when we tell a story, in a sense, we make it our own because we arrange it and we decide what's important. And, you know, to me, there's nothing where somebody's telling a story and then a friend or a spouse says, well, it didn't happen like that. And they, you know, okay. jump in and I'm like, I've learned to say, no, 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 no. This is this person's story. You don't get to rearrange it. Um, that importance of, of owning our, sort of owning our story and being allowed to arrange it as we see fit, because you, you and I could have an experience and you will tell the story radically differently than I will tell the story um, because of things that are your viewpoint, what's important to you. Um, so that, that necessity of telling our own story, not someone else's. Yes. So we, we absolutely bring ourselves to the storytelling that we do. Um, even like, as you say, we, we might've, had the experience with someone else right at our side, but we're, we both noticed different things and drawn different meanings uh, from that experience. So we'll each have our own story to tell. And then what I have found is if I've made a film, that story has been filtered through me. So it's coming from my point of view, but then the audience brings something of themselves to that film and it filters through them. Uh, the first film I ever had made that I had written uh, was a German film called After the Truth, which was a German-made Holocaust film. Kathy and I, my wife Kathy is my, often my co-writer. Uh, she and I flew to Berlin for the premiere, saw that movie with German audiences. They filtered that holocaust story through their experience as germans so there's it's a somber experience it's silent it's dealing with a sense of what is my responsibility to this story well after that film played in theaters in germany it was embraced by jewish film festivals really all around the world kathy and i had the opportunity to go to some of those festivals well, those audiences experience that film very differently. So when a witness is on the stand um, in the film describing what happened to them at Auschwitz, where the Germans were silent, the Jewish audience gasped. And, mm -hmm. and I realized, oh, the Germans are identifying with the perpetrators and saying, is that my grandparent? the Jews were identifying with the victims and saying, is that my grandparent? Mm -hmm. And so they were experiencing the violence of what happened in a different way. That's a pretty stark illustration of how we each bring our own experience, I think, to every story. I mean, one of my favorite things is to see a film with my husband and a couple of friends and then have dinner afterwards and discuss a film um, just to see what did you see in it? You know, it's funny. Some person, one person will say, oh my gosh, I loved it. It just spoke to me. And the other person will be like, I hated it. You know, it's like, what? How could you hate it? I loved it. And, and just to have this discussion of what different people 
saw in the same story. The, the film experience is amazing. Yeah, I think we we come to film for different things. Some of us come for the theme. Some come for a particular emotion. Uh, I I don't like many horror films because I just don't want to be scared in my own house after the movie. Uh, <laughs> but some people love that feeling of being mm. terrified or horrified. Um, I love dramas. You know, I want to read that book you described because I want to cry for an hour after I've read it. Uh, I, that's so counterintuitive that we would... You'll have to call. If you read it, you'll have to call me. I want to know. And then we can, we can share our experience <laughs> of what we, what we saw. Um, and I find there, there are films I love for their story that a cinematographer might look at and he's so put off by the bad camera work or something that he can't enjoy that. Uh, so I think that's part of why we have different responses. And sometimes um, we just love a story because it reinforces what we think, which is, yeah, that can be okay. But also sometimes we need a story that challenges what we think and helps us see something that we otherwise would never see. And I, I love that experience of kind of having my mind blown and yeah. thinking, oh, I've never looked at it that way before that's that is so interesting to me i mean i love that when that happens in a book or a film or or even like you said any kind of art form a, a piece of music um a painting a poem where you suddenly see the world differently or you go you just have one of those aha moments um where you just know something shifted i love that yeah it's very exciting yeah. John Paul II's letter to artists talks about the work of the artist being to go and see what others don't see, often the invisible things, and then bringing those things back and making them perceptible. Wow. So whether I it's... I can read that. I haven't read it in a long time. Yeah. No, and I just reread it this week, and I hadn't read it and reread it in years. And I feel like every time I read it, uh, because I teach some of these ideas and I'm kind of steeped in them, I'm I'm seeing more and more. Uh, That's fascinating to make the visible. I mean, to make the invisible visible. Yeah, it's and artists have those particular skills to be able to do that. Um, I, I'm not a painter, so I can't paint you a painting of what I see, uh, but I can through storytelling through words which are my medium and also directing film i can show you things that uh, there's really no other way to convey them flannery o'connor uh the great catholic short story writer and novelist was asked what her story meant uh, which i think is a fair question her stories are difficult to uh, understand and she said something like well if i could tell you in a nut i think the question was tell me in a nutshell what it means if i could put it oh, in I a nutshell just imagine I have, how she answered that <laughs> yeah, i wouldn't have had to write the story the story is its own the nutshell right right <laughs> i can just imagine her being asked a question like that <laughs> yeah i suspect she did not suffer fools so i yeah she yeah. probably left them with a a bruise my favorite line in her any of her work is I think it's um, a good man is hard to find where where the criminal is just shot. The woman says she'd have been a good woman if she just had a gun to her head her whole life. Yeah, <laughs> it's my favorite line, and I use it. You know, if I just had a gun to my head my whole life, I'd have been a really good person. <laughs> right. Uh, well, Flannery, Flannery O'Connor is an interesting example of you know a person of deep faith who does not tell easy nice pretty stories right. uh, but her her stories are meaningful and there's truth in them mm. uh, I, I actually have students read a good man is hard to find and then i ask them to tell me where do you see the author's catholicism coming through because mm -hmm. uh, it's not obvious no. but but there's a compassion for even this character the misfit 
who's a, a criminal and a killer. And there's, um, there's something of redemption in that moment when this really mean old woman has this gun in her face and for the first time sees that this misfit really is her fellow human being and deserves her love. Uh, so there's, there's, it's a redemptive story, but it's not a story for children. No, and that moment at the end where he's cleaning his glasses, I mean, that's just a brilliant moment. He's, he's wiping the blood off his glasses. You know, he's going to see more clearly yeah. now. I mean, it's just so subtle. Oh, love to have met her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you're working at a Catholic university. Um, and, and we mentioned before the interview started that, you know, nowadays children, young people are not, you know, making the decision to go to college on their own. Um, it's being made usually with their family, with parents. Um, so I'm picturing parents, you know, who want their child to become a doctor or a lawyer or go into computers. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, I want to make films. Um, and being like, no, <laughs> I want you to make money. You're going to college, so you can make money. Um, you know, they want, I mean, we certainly care about happiness, but, um, but I think, you know, like they, they picture their child, like you standing out on the other side of the wall at Warner Brothers forever. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah I, I, so I think that. Um, first of all, uh, if someone has a child who is an artist, um, they are probably not going to convert them into an accountant. Uh, <laughs> so, um, if someone has said you should ride the horse in the direction it's going. Um, <laughs> um, that was producer that. Linda, o <laughs> Linda Oost. In, um, but I, I think that... Um, it, there's a wisdom in in recognizing that the world is can be a hostile place to faith, and um, but also as people who follow Jesus recognize that he he did mention that we should go into all the world and uh, to invite people to follow him. Um, and Pope John Paul II famously um, said, fear not, as did apparently every angel anyone ever encountered <laughs> um, said, don't be afraid. So um, I think we can be people of faith and of courage and of generosity to actually love our neighbors um, by offering what we have to them and if we're business people we can offer a useful product service we can create meaningful jobs for people if we're artists we have our art to offer it is not the most direct route to money and even though in the film industry it's a it's one of the rare places in the history of art making where you can make a good living um, I'm sitting in a house right now that was paid for mostly by, you know, Paramount Pictures, um, <laughs> paying me to write draft after draft of an action adventure film. Uh, but also there are, you know, there are years where that, you don't make a lot of money that way. Uh, so there is, there is this cost of you're setting aside financial security but what you're getting is you get to exercise the gifts that God has invested in you. Uh, potentially, you get to communicate God's simple truths to millions of people in a language they understand. That seems to me a pretty valuable thing. Um, and so it calls into question for, oh, I'm a parent, um, calls into question I say I'm a person of faith. Well, how much faith am I willing to entrust my children to God and to his call on their lives for the sake of 
our neighbors um, for the, who need encouragement and to know they're not alone and maybe to, um, to encounter someone like Paul in Athens who's speaking to them in a language they can understand about this unknown God that they've been looking for but haven't quite been able to find. Um, I think we're better for, for that. You can wind up going in directions that you don't expect to go as well. I mean, my degree was in the oral interpretation of literature, basically storytelling and, and, and philosophy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, years later, I found myself working at Holy Apostles College and Seminary, you know, helping, um, well, teaching homiletics, which wasn't in the pl original plans at all. Um, but the journey kind of led me there, and that led me here. So, <laughs> you know. yes, I mean, I I did not set out to be a film professor, right. um, but I found that uh, that I love I love teaching uh, what I have had the opportunity to learn, and so um, I don't want to sit in this room twenty four seven alone writing. Uh, I love getting out of this room every week, being in the classroom with students. Um, and uh, yeah, life comes with lots of different chapters and storytelling expertise can be used in very commercial ways, you know, making literal commercials, uh, doing marketing, uh, business, law. I mean, whoever tells the best story in the in the courtroom. <laughs> yeah. Wins. So, right. yeah, so storytelling expertise has applications um, everywhere. My wife just earned a master's in narrative medicine uh, from the Keck School of Medicine at USC. It's the application of storytelling and story listening within the practice of medicine so that physicians can actually understand what's going on with their patients and make more accurate diagnoses and you get to cures faster and more cheaply. And so medicine is beginning to embrace this as a way to improve the quality and the bottom line of the practice That's of medicine. Narrative, did you narrative medicine, yeah. Oh, I have to write that down. <laughs> that sounds exciting. And she loves it because she's she's been in both of the the world of being a screenwriter, and then also a parent. Our, our son was diagnosed with a brain tumor when he was five years old. He's now in his 30s and um, has had a lifelong struggle dealing with the effects of his tumor and treatment. And she's found how much story benefits parents who are dealing with life-threatening illness in their children. And, and she... So that's why she pursued this degree was so that she could continue to help medical professionals and patients connect with one another um, meaningfully. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned that. I was thinking how, you know, one of the great things, I mean, there's many, you know, problems, of course, with social media, but one of the great things are the, like many Facebook groups where people come together um, from all over the world to share their medical problems, um, their stories of loss um, and how important that is. Um, yeah, it is one of the things that uh, the internet has enabled is we can find each other. And if there's only seven of us anywhere in the world, now there's a chance that we can find <laughs> each other. Whereas, you know, in the past, you would have just thought you were the only one for your right. whole life. Right. And now we come together with all kinds of stories. It's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's really exciting that you're able to, you know, pass on so much that you've learned to young people. Uh, what courses do you actually teach? What are they? What are they called? What are they like? I so I I teach uh, a class to freshmen called Story, Genre, and Structure, where I talk about how stories work. Uh, some of the things we've talked about today, uh, what stories do for society. Uh, and then I start getting into some of the practical principles of what is it, uh, how do I craft a story so that it grabs attention right at the start and then holds it all the way to the end? 
and delivers. When I teach in homiletics, I do the same yeah. thing. <laughs> yes. And, so, and it, you know, we deliver emotion and meaning um, uh, along the way. So I teach that class, and then I teach um, a class called Fundamentals of Story Development, where I get into step by step how do you how do you come up with ideas for a feature length movie, figure out who the characters are and really develop those, and then find the story that they drive all the way to the end of the movie, and how do you how do you organize yourself before you start writing? Uh, what will be a 110 or so page document um, that really puts a movie on the page using nothing but words. That's a bit of a trick. And so I teach that. They generate their own movie ideas and develop their characters and the structure of their story. And then I teach a class called Writing for the Screen 1 and 2, where they actually write that feature-length screenplay. And it's a massive endeavor, the most complex project they've ever done. And at the uh, the end of of the process, when they turn in that finished screenplay, uh, I buy them all lunch. It's the only time I do that. But um, I, I used to ask them, like, don't you want like ice cream and donuts? Uh, and they go, no, we're college students. We want food. And so, <laughs> Um, so they order whatever they want and I go out and get it. And uh, because I, I think it's important for writers, filmmakers to celebrate milestones. If we're waiting until like we're on the Oscar stage, we're going to be waiting a long time. So I think we should take every opportunity that we can to just notice that, oh, I just did something pretty significant. I, I came up with the spark of an idea and now look, it's a whole movie on the page. Um, and then I teach them, now you got to do more drafts, you have to rewrite. Uh, so uh, we've got classes I teach on writing dialogue, on writing for television, writing short films, um, and then more advanced writing workshop uh, classes. Uh, and what I try to do is give them knowledge, but also practical skills and experience so that by the time they graduate, they've identified their special interest. And also they know they've begun their, their writing, filmmaking work, and they can then continue it um, long-term and develop the world-class skills that are really required to make things that our very sophisticated audiences will want to watch. So then you pass them on to other professors, right? Because yeah, there's so, a whole department of filmmaking, correct? Yeah, exactly. So we've got people who specialize in editing and directing and acting, um, other writers as well, uh, who I find that all writers know different things. And so I love listening to writers because I, I learn what they know. Yeah, I think I'm going to get to interview some of your colleagues as well. So that'll be exciting to sort of put the whole thing together. Well, I will want to listen to those interviews because I always want to sneak <laughs> into their classrooms and learn what they know. Uh, there are some, I, one of the great things about teaching at JP Catholic is that I get to work with some really fantastic people. I'll bet, I'll bet. How big are your classes? I'm curious. The more advanced workshop classes sometimes are um, as small as seven or eight, which really enables us, enables me to get very personal feedback to each yeah. writer on their project. Uh, and sometimes they're, I've, I've got a class right now um, that's as large as about 40. And uh, that's more of a lecture class. It's a class called culture making, where we look at what is culture and how how does it shape me? How do I shape it? Um, and so that works as a as a larger class. Uh, but when we get into yeah, we get into the hands on stuff. Those tend to be smaller classes. That's wonderful. That's a, that's a nice thing for students and parents looking to come to college to know. Um, I mean, at Holy Apostles, my my homiletics classes were usually between about seven and. 
15 at the most. And like you said, that gives you a lot of hands-on working with someone, um, really digging into storytelling. Um, yeah, and you get to know the students and right. you, get to, you get to hear their stories. Uh, <laughs> and that's, um, that's where the joy of teaching is, is in that human connection. Uh, teaching online during COVID, uh, that was, you know, a lot of that was very challenged. And I found myself curling up in a ball on the bed after each class. Uh, right. So I'm so grateful to be back, uh, be back in person, uh, working face to face with my students. There's nothing like the classroom, yeah. both as a student and as, as a teacher. There's to me, there's just nothing like it. <laughs> yeah, I get to I get to go to college year after year after year, and they never make me leave. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we haven't, I know we're, we're running a bit over on time. I don't want to keep you, but I could keep you all day and we could just talk, but. Um, yeah, the, I, I will I'll just mention one thing, um, which we haven't talked about. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a book that my wife and I recently uh, wrote called The Defining Moment, uh, how writers and actors build characters. And the idea there, I think, is just universal. Um, and we got it from a mentor, a screenwriting mentor of ours, as we were developing that German film. And he said, I have a theory that all of us are the product of a handful of moments that really have shaped us, you know, more than the other moments in our lives. And I've referenced one of those in my life. It was the diagnosis of my son with a brain tumor. You don't really know me and you can't really understand Kathy's work in the medical world without knowing that story about what we have gone through as a family. And the idea is that if we can locate those moments that have shaped us, moments of of wounds and loss but also moments of growth or the discovery of your calling or your gift uh, moments of healing um, and i've experienced those uh, well now if you understand how that works in an actual human in you you can draw on that to create these defining moments or locate them for characters that you're developing uh, but i I also think that businesses, you know, businesses have origin stories um, and they have value stories. Why is this company built on this value? And as a business person, if you understand that, you can pass that story on to new employees so that it isn't just, here's our mission or value statement that's a poster on the wall, but here's the story of the founder and why this particular value mattered so much to her and why that poster's on the wall. Well, Jesus talked about the, uh, the yeast that infects the lump of dough. I think stories can be like yeast that carries values, shared history, uh, and, and it spreads. I think the reason that John Paul II's face was so well known and why he used media is his job was to pastor a billion people around the world. The world. <laughs> yeah. you, you cannot do a one-on-one -on -one face to face with a billion people. And so media story being um, content that's carried through media and spread like that yeast through the whole lump of dough. Uh, that for me as, an, as a communicator is really exciting. And we communicate in every context, medicine, business, as well as I, I have the privilege sometimes of communicating to potentially millions of people because of the medium in which I work. But the most satisfying interactions are still those one-on-ones in the classroom or at a film festival. Uh, with someone who's just seen a film uh, that I wrote, and then we get to talk about it, and I get to hear back from them. What did that bring up in you? 
That's awesome. I would love to either have a copy of the defining moment or the PDF and interview both you and your wife, whose name is Kathy. Kathy, Kathy. I thought. Yeah. I'd love to interview both that of would you. Be fun. Discuss that book because that sounds really exciting. All right, great. Well, we'll let's connect and we'll figure out how to get you a copy of that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been really just delightful. Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed this. Want to end us with a prayer? Yeah, I'd be happy to. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, thank you that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, I'm now imagining, because of what Kiki said, uh, the stories you tell um, among yourself. Thank you that you've told us stories that reveal yourself to us and that reveal like what love is and that there is no one outside of your love or outside of our call to love. Let us have courage to share our stories with one another and let us offer the great empty cup of attention to one another so that we can give that gift and also receive the gift that others can give us with their stories. God, send us into all the world with courage and without fear and side by side with each other, which is how you sent your followers into the world. And let the world be richer and more hopeful, more loved, and may they find their creator and the one who loves them best in Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I just want to mention if anyone listening and yourself, if you read a little life, <laughs> commit to reading it all the way through to the end because about halfway through you're going to say, I can't believe this Catholic woman recommended this book. It's a it's a hard book to read and it's a very painful book. So, um, so I would just say, you know, just read it through to the end. Yeah. Great recommendation. <laughs> I, and I, I love getting recommendations um, to help me find my own way to, you know, really good, good stories, yeah. good books, good films. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard story, but it's, uh, like I said, for me, it showed me God's love. Mm. But it's not a religious book in any other sense. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Kiki. It. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get a chance to interview both you and your wife on the, the definitive moment. Uh, the defining moment. The yeah. defining moment. Okay. Yeah. That would be wonderful. And I look forward, I'll let your colleagues know. If you enjoyed this, let them know. Because hopefully um, they'll, they'll schedule some interviews in, in the coming month or so as well. I'll spread the word. Great. Stay in touch. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. God bless.